is in good forgotten Kashmir, the other side of the line of control by Ambassador Dinka P. Shivasta. We are joined by the author, the, the esteemed author, and a distinguished expert on the subject, Ambassador Dinka P. Shivasta. Uh, I'll just read out uh, his introduction. He has done really commendable work in the field. And I'll request all of you to mute yourself uh, except the speaker. Ambassador Shivastal dealt with Jammu and Kashmir issue for eight years in the UN division from January 1993 till 2000. Also, he dealt with human rights, international and humanitarian law and terrorism issues. He has served in Karachi. He retired as ambassador to Iran, where he negotiated MOU for Indian participation in the Chahabahar port. Post retirement, he served on the boards of directors of Gale, India Ports Global Limited, and senior advisor to ONGC Videsh Limited. He is the author of Forgotten Kashmir, which uh, the other side of the line of control, which we are going to discuss today. In regarding Jammu and Kashmir, he was involved in successful Indian lobbying efforts against four Pakistani attempts to have resolutions adopted in UNGA and UNHCR in 1993-94. He dealt with human rights at the UN Fora for five years. He was also the part of the drafting committee of the Statute of the National Human Rights Commission of India. And he was also a member of Indian team that prepared the response to the ICJ report on Kashmir, ICRC. He was the member of Indian team to negotiate MOU for ICRC's work in Jammu and Kashmir. And he was a nodal officer for discussions with Yun Mojib, Indian candidature for the permanent membership of UNSC. Ambassador Shivastra prepared first formal statement on the Indian candidature uh, for the permanent membership of UNSC. He dealt with this subject for about eight years. He also dealt with India's lobbying efforts to contain the diplomatic fallout of Indian nuclear tests in Pokhran II and the internationalization of JNK issue. During the Kargil War, he dealt with Indian lobbying efforts against the internationalization of JNK situation in the aftermath of the Kargil War. In the field of terrorism, he, uh, he was a member of the joint working groups on counterterrorism efforts with the US, EU, UK, Canada, and Russia. He drafted the Comprehensive Convention of International Terrorism, obtained the negotiating mandate for the UN General Assembly for elaborating the convention. At the International Court of Justice, Ambassador Shivasta was a member of the Indian team to the International Court of Justice in the case filed by Pakistan on the shooting down of the Pakistani spy plane Atlantic. EU 2000-2003, and in the EU, he lobbied European Parliament against with the successful adoption of the resolutions against Pakistan, U.S. Congress. As a first secretary at the Indian Embassy in the U.S., Ambassador Shivasta was involved in lobbying with the U.S. Congress. So with such distinguished work and uh, eminent expertise in the subject, we are really honored to have Ambassador Shivasta today with us. So now, without wasting much time, I'll just, you know, the floor is open to you. I'll request you to share your thoughts and your remarks about this amazing book, which is very relevant in today's time, particularly after the abrogation of Article 370. The subject is very close to my heart because I have served in Jammu and Kashmir during the critical times of the abrogation of Article 370. And this particular step has unfolded. It has, you know, like brought many things back from the past and we are again uh, revisiting the fundamental questions about the POK and then amidst this situation, your book is certainly an eye opener and definitely it can be a great guiding trajectory for all of us. Uh, over to you. Thank you. Thanks for the very generous introduction. Could I request you to, put, to show the map and the background for the readers? Yes, sir. Well, the recording, please switch on. Uh, yeah, yeah, recording. I have started the recording. This yes. The recent decision of the Indian Supreme Court validating the government's decision for, for deletion of Article 370 has clarified the legal issues. The difference in political perceptions remain. Mainstream media and most people in the country and in Kashmir, Jammu and Kashmir have welcomed the decision. There is a small section uh, of political opinion which has some reservations, but I may add here that the two main parties in uh, in JNK, despite their reservations, have both confirmed that they are going to take part in forthcoming elections in that state. 
and this state, the statehood of JNK has been restored. Pakistan has predictably enough decides the decision, and the prime minister, uh, caretaker prime minister Kakar, uh, went to Muzaffarabad and uh, has uh, repeated the usual rhetoric about fighting uh, 300 battles and so on. Uh, with India and the caretaker foreign minister Gilani has uh, again uh, made references to UN Security Council resolutions. He said that the final disposition of the state has to be in terms of the UNSC resolutions as well as aspirations of the people of Kashmir. How far has Pakistan observed these UN Security Council resolutions? As Pakistan did, why did Pakistan reject the plebiscite uh, under the UN resolutions? Has Pakistan treated people of POK and Gilgit Baltistan on par with the people of Pakistan? Why does Pakistan give only seven, uh, seven pesa? For the same molecule of water for which the people of uh, Pakistan get 1 rupee 10 paisa. In other words, the POK people get 1 seventh for their natural resources what the Pakistan, uh, Pakistani provinces get. These are some of the questions I would like to uh, discuss during my talk today, but let me first, uh, let's first get back to the map uh, you see the jammu and kashmir state the bulge at the top in purple color uh, that is that area is that is called northern areas which has been renamed by pakistan as gilgit baltistan this is the bulk of the uh, territory illegally occupied by pakistan it's in fact 85% what Pakistan calls Azad Kashmir uh, uh, or, or POK is the thin sliver of territory running north south opposite Jammu at the lower end. Now, this is simply a rump, rump accounting for barely 15% of the total territory occupied by illegally occupied by Pakistan. We call, of course, we call the entire region, that is the northern areas, as well as what Pakistan calls uh, AJK, as, as POK. Now, go, apart from the issue of uh, definition, there's a larger uh, question. Why did Pakistan separate northern areas or get Baltistan from POK? This you know, the Pakistani version of truth keeps changing. A uh, long time back in the 90s, I saw an American movie. It was a comedy and the uh, hero is caught uh, red-handed uh, by his second wife flirting with, the, with his third girlfriend. And the wife accuses him of various things. And uh, the hero very calmly replies uh, that, you know, to his wife that these are what you are saying are versions of truth. And the wife retorts, truth has, truth is only one, there are no versions of truth, but Pakistan has versions of truth. So the current version of truth which Pakistan and Pakistan's apologists uh, claim is that northern areas, which is 85% of POK were separated from POK in pursuance of Karachi agreement of 1949. This agreement was signed on was signed uh, on behalf of Pakistan by Nawab Gurmani, who was the Minister for Kashmir Affairs, and on behalf of POK, it was allegedly signed by Sardar Ibrahim, the then President of POK, and Chaudhry Ghulam Abbas, who was Chairman of Muslim Conference. Now, the agreement was kept secret. It was kept secret for more than two decades. It came to light in 1993 in a historic uh, judgment of POK High Court, where the POK High Court 
ask Pakistan to return this territory to POK. And now, why did and POK High Court said that separation of northern areas from POK by Pakistan was a violation of UN Security Council resolutions by Pakistan. <laughs> now, this was a slap on Pakistan's face. Why did, had Pakistan kept this agreement secret for all these, uh, for more than 26 years? The reason is that Pakistan had changed the territorial status quo of the territory illegally occupied by it without plebiscite. That was a breach of UN Security Council resolutions which Pakistan keeps citing. Now, this story, you know, as I said, Pakistan's uh, version of truth keeps changing. This story has two caveats. The first is that Sardar Ibrahim, who was, its, you know, who, who as, uh, as POK president is supposed to have ceded this territory to Pakistan, in his later life, kept on saying, in other words, in English, he said he had committed other mistakes in life, but not this one. So he completely denied having ever signed Karachi agreement. Now, the second caveat, and that is Pakistan actually took over this territory right in the beginning in November 1947, uh, this territory, northern areas, was uh, the headquarters was Gilgit Agency, and Major Brown, a British officer who headed Gilgit Scouts, a militia force which was under the Maharaja, raised the flag of revolt on 31st October 1947. This is within a week of you know the war breaking out after the tribal invasion had begun. Now, Major Brown, in his uh, memoirs, has written that he handed over the, the control of the territory after, you know, arresting the, the governor, which was uh, or Maharaja's representative, Brigadier Gansara Singh. He said he handed over the territory to Muhammad Alam, uh, Muhammad, As uh, Muhammad Alam. Muhammad Alam, who was he? He was Pakistan's political agent. He was actually a Tassildar in Northwest Frontier Province. Tassildar, as you know, is a junior revenue official, and he was sent by Pakistan as a political agent to take charge of the control of the Northern ter Territories. Now, this raises an interesting question. The question is that by Pakistan's, the Pakistan claims that the provisional government of POK had been formed on 24th October 47, this is three weeks before Major Brown is supposed to have handed over northern areas to Pakistan's political agent. Now, if since northern areas were part of Kashmir Riyasat or Kashmir state, it would have been logical to hand it over to the so-called provisional government of POK, which was already in existence. Why was it handed over to the political agent of Pakistan? So, what this episode show, shows is that Pakistan had separated 85% of territory of POK and absorbed, brought, brought it under its direct administrative control. And of course, it had the blessings of the British, without which uh, it was not possible that Gilgit uh, scouts headed by a British officer would have gone against the Maharaja who was. Uh, his master, uh, legally and every sense of the word. Why were the British interested in this? Because of the, in, in, in handing over this to Pakistan, because of the strategic location. If you look at the map, can you please, can we go back to the map? If you look at the map, this is the part where the state of Jammu and Kashmir touches on top, what is called Wakhan Strip. This is part of the uh, Afghanistan. So the strategic importance of this region is that without Pakistani control of northern areas, 
there would have been no CPEG. China Pakistan Economic Corridor enters Pakistan through northern areas. Indus River, which uh, has an enormous importance for Pakistan, which is a which is an agricultural country that also enters Pakistan through northern areas. And conversely, if India had retained control of northern areas, we would have had geographical contiguity both with uh, Afghanistan as well as Central Asia. So this was the reason why the British strate strategists who were still not reconciled to loss of the jewel in the crown and were betting upon their creation Pakistan to retain uh, influence in this area had arranged the whole thing. And of course, Major Brown in his memoirs has said that he was, uh, he received uh, a British uh, title, you know, award, uh, reward, uh, award uh, for, the, you know, for whatever services he had rendered. Now, this drama was being played out against the background of the tribal invasion, which had already begun. Uh, a month earlier on 20th October, and as you know, 26th October, Maharaja acceded to India and Indian governments and its forces. Sadar Ibrahim has recounted to uh, uh, an, uh, an interesting story. This was this has been narrated by Yusuf Sarraf, a very senior Muslim conference leader who later became Chief Justice of POK Supreme Judicial Council. Sarraf has written in his two volumes history of this region that Sadar Ibrahim said that he declared provisional government of POK on the basis of two phone calls received on the midnight of 23rd, 24th October. Who were the callers? One was Aja Rahim, the commissioner of Ravel Pindi, and the second was Begum Naseem, the then wife of this military adventurer. Colonel Akbar Khan, who was already who had already entered uh, Kashmir at the head of the tribal Lashkar. Now, the situation where a middle rung civilian officer and the wife of a middle rung army officer can order declaration of formation of provisional government. It clearly shows this was no indigenous struggle. Why did the calls come from Rawal Pindi and not Karachi? After all, Karachi was the capital of Pakistan at the time. Uh, the reason was that Rawal Pindi then as now was the headquarters of uh, Pakistan army, which has played a very major role in creation of, and uh, in, in, in crafting Pakistan's Kashmir policy. Now, it is also interesting that uh, the declaration which was issued when the so-called provisional government was formed was uh, it nowhere mentions punch uprising. You know, if you read uh, today's accounts of Pakistan and Pakistani sympathizers, they say that the you know they tried to give this whole thing an indigenous color as a as a spontaneous uprising against uh, operation by Maharaja's forces. If it was such an important event, it should have been mentioned in the so-called uh, declaration of provisional government. It does finds no, no mention. So obviously, this incident has been blown out of all proportions and later uh, used to create uh, a narrative which is completely divorced from reality. There's one more interesting point before we uh, move on, and that is the Akbar Khan has given the date of formation of uh, provisional government 27th October. He's written as his memoirs, which are very aptly titled Raiders in Kashmir, which again gives light to this narrative that this was an indigenous struggle. He has said that He's, he said, you know, he's given a vivid account of the deliberations on the Pakistani side. He said that the decision to launch tribal invasion was taken in a series of meetings chaired by Pakistan's Prime Minister Liaquat Ali Khan. This is while Pakistan was claiming in the Security Council that it had no role in the tribal invasion. Akbar Khan has also written that they were listening to 
Pakistan radio broadcast on 27th October when they heard that the previous day Kashmir had acceded to India and Indian army had moved into the state. He's written in the same paragraph that by the evening of that day, the provisional government had been announced. Now, this this is cannot be a printing mistake because this is a whole paragraph about you know the announcement on the on the Pakistan radio and he mentioned the previous day and so on. So it clearly places the date as 27th October. Why did Pakistan change the narrative later from 27th to 24th October? This was to delegitimize the act of accession. Because Pakistani representative argued in the Security Council that Maharaja had lost the authority to accede to India because he had lost control of the territory and control of the army under international law. These are two attributes of sovereignty. So to buttress this narrative, Pakistan changed the date from 27th October to 24th October to bring it before the accession to, to India. Now, very briefly, you know, the war went on for a year and a half in August 28. The UN Commission on India and Pakistan adopted a resolution and you see the text briefly that it has three parts. Part one was ceasefire, part two was uh, uh, truce arrangements and the truce arrangements has two parts. The first part says that Pakistan will withdraw all its forces under its control. And the second part says that when the government of Pakistan has completely withdrawn its forces, all its forces, then India will withdraw bulk of its forces. Now, there's a distinction. While Pakistan was asked to withdraw all forces, India was asked to withdraw only bulk of its forces, which means India was allowed to retain some forces. This was a recognition as close as UN came to the fact that India was the had the had the legal uh, status, while Pakistan had no status, and therefore it was asked to withdraw all its forces. The plebiscite was a third part, and clearly the sequence shows that the third part could the performance of uh, you know the plebiscite could only be held only after Pakistan had withdrawn all its forces, which was part the earlier part of the resolution. Now, let me come to and the, the plebiscite, and this is the most intriguing part of the story. The common perception is that India promised plebiscite and then went back on it or started dragging its feet, particularly after uh, India lost the uh, Abdullah card when Abdullah was arrested in 1953. Now, this is completely at variance with the truth. The UN documents clearly show, and the international literature, which is British literature of the period, clearly show that it was Pakistan which rejected plebiscite. You know, plebiscite has been talked ad infinitum by Pakistan. But there have been only three occasions when a formal proposal was made. And on all three occasions, India was willing to consider it. Pakistan rejected it. The first such occasion arose on 2nd November 1947, when Mountbatten visited uh, Lahore to meet Jinnah. And Mountbatten suggested plebiscite in the UN species. Jinnah rejected it. Why did Jinnah reject it? Because Tribal invasion was still on. Tribals had raped, killed, and plundered Hindus, Muslims, and Christians, and Sikhs without discrimination. So Jinnah knew that if a plebiscite was held, the vote will go against Pakistan. So he he went back on it. Now this account is given in uh, uh, Campbell Philip John Campbell's uh, book Mission with Mountbatten. Campbell was. Mountbatten's press attaché. This is certainly not an Indian account or an Indian official. Now, the second occasion arose in 1950. This was 
when the UN appointed a mediator, Avan Dixon, an Australian jurist, Avan Dixon came to India, Pakistan, and he made a proposal for regional plebiscite. He said that a, play, a plebiscite across the entire state will result in pockets of minorities on either side of the political divide and lead to forced migration, which was already happening on a much larger scale in the rest of the subcontinent. So to avoid it, he suggested regional plebiscite because he said there are regions and limited the scope to Delhi. He said there are other regions, you know, given the composition of the population, it was clear which way they'll go, for instance, Ladakh or Jammu. The bone of contention was Valley because the majority population were Muslims, about 70%. But the dominant political force, that is National Conference, had opted for India. So he limited the scope of plebiscite to the Valley. Pakistan should have jumped at it because Pakistani claim then and and now is that, you know, it's a uh, Muslim state and Jammu and Kashmir is a Muslim majority region. And therefore, uh, it was natural that Jammu and Kashmir should join uh, Muslim Pakistan rather than uh, secular India. But Pakistan, despite this, uh, the advantage 70% of population being Muslims, Pakistan turned it down. This is recorded by Avan Dixon in his report to the United Nations, which is available in public do domain. Now, this part is known. What most people have missed out, and I have brought it out, I think, for the first time anyone has done in my book, in the same paragraph, Avan Dixon has gone on to say, after he described Pakistani rejection, he said that, but I'm given the impression that Pakistan will accept a partition of the state Provided it got the value. Now, this is very significant. What does this mean? It means that, pa that Pakistani claim that regional plebiscite was a, you know, Pakistan had rejected this uh, Avan Dixon proposal, and Pakistan's claim was regional plebiscite was a departure from the principle of single plebiscite. Now, this sentence that Pakistan was willing to accept partition, it clearly, sh which was also a departure from the principle of uh, single plebiscite. It clearly shows that Pakistan was that this, you know, this distinction between single plebiscite and regional plebiscite was simply an afterthought. It was an excuse to get out of a difficult situation. Now, this has to be borne in mind when we move to the third and the most uh, significant uh, event. This was August 1953. Sheikh Abdullah was dismissed and arrested. Muhammad, Pakistan proposed bilateral talks. Muhammad Ali Bogra, Pakistani Prime Minister, came to India. Bogra Nehru talks took place. A joint communique was issued, which is in public domain. And the two sides agreed to a plebiscite. Bogra went back. Three months later, on 1st December 1953, he wrote to Pandit Nehru, going back on the plebiscite. Why? The same ground it had invoked in 1950 when it had turned down Avan Dixon proposal. It said that regional plebiscite was a departure from the principle of single plebiscite, but as I have shown, Pakistan was willing to make the departure provided it got the value and got the value without a vote. So this was, now this was four months before Nehru is supposed to have turned down plebiscite in April 1954, after Pakistan joined the American-led military alliance. So, idea was already dead. It had been killed by Pakistan. Now, why was Pakistan again and again rejecting what uh, plebiscite under UN auspices, what was and, and remains its principal plan? To understand this, we have to look in, into the domestic uh, internal situation of POK. In, April 1950, that is a month before Avan Dixon came to the subcontinent, Pakistan dismissed Sadar Ibrahim, the first president of POK. This led to Sudhan revolt. Sud Sadar Ibrahim belonged to Sudhan tribe. They were a martial tribe and they rose in revolt. First, the Pakistan, Punjab constabulary was deployed and then Pakistan army was deployed. 
The Sudan Rip revolt spread soon to all, uh, all parts of POK and the revolt lasted for almost 10 years. Now, what I'm citing, quoting is directly, you know, in 1955, uh, Muslim conference, which was the main political force in that, in that region, gave a memorandum to Pakistan Constituent Assembly complaining of the military operation and you can read this that for the last few years people of Azad Kashmir in general and those of Punch in particular have been subjected to great torture and terrorization. Ruthless and random firing by mortar gun took place resulting in many deaths. Now uh, mark these words, mortar guns are heavy caliber guns. This is not a uh, rifle or, or, or an ordinary gun. On the Indian side, there may have been there have been incidents where firing took place, but never, never, never guns to never have, have been fired at the civilian population. Next, next slide. Now the memorandum goes on to say, no, no, go back, go back. The memorandum, read the first paragraph, that women have not only been raped, but in some cases their breasts and secret parts have been bitten by the police and its officers. There are also instances of teenage boys being subjected to unnatural vices by the men of Platoon 14 of the PC in Soon village. Terrorized by this situation, 3,000 people have gone over to the Indian side of the ceasefire line. Now, these were Kashmiris, these were Muslims, and they had who were, you know, who, who Pakistan claims to represent and protect. And they had crossed over to the Indian side for their, their, their protection. Now, this memorandum, this is, uh, you know, it, it's a most formal document given by Muslim Conference to Pakistan Constituent Assembly, was produced in the UN Security Council debate in 1957 by Krishnan Menon, Pakistani foreign minister, uh, who was a very voluble figure. Uh, he he was present, but did not demur. So obviously this was this was true, and of course this finds references in all the literature which has been uh, which has come in public domain uh, since then. Now this was circulated as a UN document, and then something very curious happened. Somebody decided to classify. Now, this makes no sense. A document which has already been disclosed in public, which has been circulated as a UN document, which are public documents, why classify them? So, obviously, if powers that be wanted to avoid uh, embarrassment to Pakistan. And unfortunately, this faded from public memory, not only from the, uh, you know, in Pakistan, it faded from public memory. On the Indian side, I found a reference in a book by Bhil Sharma, who was uh, one of the, who was member of the Indian delegation to the United Nations for nine sessions. And uh, then I tried to find out from the UN documents and uh, the UN Secretariat has, uh, on my request, declassified it and it has now been put on the UN website. So it's a completely authentic account. And it, this explains why Pakistan was again and again rejecting plebiscite because it was not sure of winning the vote even on its side of the border. Now let's move on to the governance of the territory. You know, the Pakistan, the two themes running, constant themes running through Pakistan's narrative, Azadi and wishes of the people, do the governing structures of which Pakistan devised in POK, do they represent wishes of the people? This whole territory was controlled by the Ministry of Kashmir Affairs, which was part of Pakistan federal government and which was incidentally located in Rawalpindi, which again tells you something. Till 1962 or early 63, the, until 62 certainly, Karachi was the capital. But along with the army headquarters, Ministry of Kashmir Affairs was also located in Rawalpindi, and they were the de facto rulers of this uh, territory. There is a very interesting uh, 
episode which was which is narrated by sarab a muslim conference leader in his uh, memoirs he says that one of the presidents of the pok he went to meet the joint secretary in the ministry of kashmir affairs as you know joint secretary is a middle rank officer in the government uh, and uh, the joint secretary in the middle of the meeting asked the pok president to go go and sit in his pa's room because it, it a call was coming from Karachi, which was the capital. So this shows really the position or the, or the contempt in which the POK president and the prime ministers were held by Pakistani officials. They were simply titular uh, leaders with no uh, substantive pass. So till 1970, no elections were took place in in uh, POK, while the Indian state of JNK regularly underwent elections and exercised the, the, the choice of leaders. In 1970, and, and of course, there were no elections held in Pakistan, so this was a reflection of the general situation there. Now, 71 war completely changed the geopolitical situation in the continent. Shimla Agreement was signed. There was a debate in, on Shimla Agreement in Pakistan National Assembly. and and Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, the, who was then president, uh, you know, he became prime minister later. He at that time he had the president's title. In his speech, he said that you know he referred to the UN Security Council resolutions of forty eight, and he said it was then and then that you lost. Kashmir. So he, this was a candid admission by the president of Pakistan that UN Security Council resolutions do not support Pakistan's case. And this was not a one off statement. He repeated it 15 days later in, in uh, Karachi. Now, there's something else which is very interesting. And this is what you see on the screen. This was a statement by Mir Ward Bakshan Bizenzo, a Baloch leader. Uh, he was one of the opposition leaders at the time. Later, he became Baluchistan chief minister. And I'll read out for the readers, should be uh, viewers, should we go on thinking aimlessly as to what will be the fate of 50 lakh Kashmiri Muslims? There are 5 crore Muslims in India as well. Do Kashmiri Muslims bear more value than 5 crore Indian Muslims? The people of Kashmir will decide their own future. Now, this is a very, very significant statement made in Pakistan National Assembly during the debate on Shimla conference by a major Pakistani political figure. Now, let me also mention something which I forgot, you know, can we go back to the previous slide for a minute? In 1971, this is May, this is before the 71 war, Ghulam Shah Khan, as Cabinet Secretary of Pakistan, issued a directive. Now, Ghulam Shah, who was Ghulam Shah Khan? He was a civil servant who later became President of Pakistan and one of the most powerful presidents who, had, who sacked two successive Prime Ministers, Benazir Bhutto and Nawaz Sharif. Now, in 71, he was the Cabinet Secretary and, you know, this is a directive which he issued. And read the last, in, last part. Every ministry in the field of its responsibility should look upon and deal with Azad Kashmir as if it were another administrative unit of the country. So, what is the significance? While Pakistan was claiming and it still claims that Azad Kashmir is not part of Pakistan and Pakistan being the good boy is awaiting plebiscite according to even resolutions, actually, internally, it has already been absorbed and integrated in that country. And here the cabinet secretary who later became the president was instructing the government, all government departments to treat it as if it was another administrative unit of the country. Now let's move forward. In 1907, after Shimla agreement, the next major milestone was in 1974. POK, uh, uh, next, POK was uh, given 
an interim constitution. This is the, and it still remains an interim constitution. Now, this is a very interesting document. You know, there is debate which has been going on uh, since the deletion of Article 370. That and particularly in the context of delimitation exercise, which is going on, that you know India is trying to change the demographic composition. There is no such thing here, but yes, demographic composition has been changed. It has been changed on the other side of the line of control, and this is built into the POK interim constitution. Actually, the composition had already taken place. Change had already taken place, but this provides the legal cover. This gives the Definition of state subject. Now, read the high portions which I have highlighted. State subject means a person for the time being residing in Azad, Jammu, and Kashmir or Pakistan. So, this opens a floodgate that anyone, it's not simply a, a resident of POK who is a state subject, but even somebody who's residing in Pakistan and that to some on a temporary basis. Uh, can be a state subject and as defined in the government of state of Jammu and Kashmir notification number so and so as amended from time to time. Now, this notification they are referring to was issued by Maharaja in 1927. Maharaja's government amended it only twice. So, what does this mean as amended from time to time? Who amended it subsequently? So, obviously, this, this, uh, this whole facade has been created to cover up the change in demographic composition, which had substantially taken place, already taken place and was in the process. It has gone on for next, since then for more than 50 years. And now the compositions completely changed. And when did the change began? The change began in, in the sixties when Mangla, Mangla Dam was constructed in PUK and that led to a mass displacement of people of that region, the Mirpuris, who are who were then, uh, you know, given uh, given uh, asylum or shelter, uh, who who are given uh, you know residence permit in UK, and today the Mirpuris are a substantial uh, constituency who keep on uh, raising this issue. Now the other very interesting part of this constitution, you know. You, you may be knowing that Pakistan de declared Ahmadiyyas as non-Muslims. Now, this was Ahmadiyyas were declared as non-Muslims in Pakistan in 75, but they were declared non-Muslims in POK before they were declared non-Muslims in Pakistan. And so the irony is that Sir Zafrullah Khan, Pakistan's first foreign minister who argued Pakistan's case on Kashmir, in the Security Council, if he were alive, he would be considered a non-Muslim, not only in Pakistan, but in POK. Now, it also tells you the, you know, the effort that Pakistan's attempt to Islamicize the whole area. That is the state's definition of state subject is very weak. There's no reference to Kashmiri or Kashmiri, but the definition of who's a Muslim was, is very, was introduced first in POK even before it was introduced in, in, in Pakistan. Now, the third and the, mo the most important part, you know, there is a constitutions in most countries or regions, wherever they are held, they define the powers of elected legislature and elected government. POK's constitution defines powers of Pakistan within POK. So this is a very strange thing. What Pakistan had done, it has created, a, the elected assemblies came into being after the constitution was, interim constitution was adopted, but the elected assemblies were, uh, have remained powerless from the beginning. And this is built into the interim constitution. What Pakistan did was to simultaneously create a parallel power structure. This was called Kashmir Council, which was headed by Pakistan's prime minister and Pakistani officials all, always had the majority. And 
under article 31 of POK constitution, all the powers were vested in the Kashmir Council headed by Pakistani Prime Minister, while the powers of the elected assembly and elected government were left undefined. Now, this is called rule by proxy, and this was much criticized. Now, let me add the last part about this, and this is the UK's interim constitution has a clause, Article 4, 7, 2, which says that nobody can question, next slide, nobody can question, no, sorry, I think that's not there, okay, that Article 4, 7, 2 says that nobody can question the ideology of state's accession to Pakistan. So, by definition, the choice of the people of POK is limited to accession to Pakistan. That renders plebiscite irrelevant because the choice has already been made for them. And in fact, there's something uh, more important. In 1972, that is full two years before POK's interim constitution came into being, Pakistan's Citizenship Act was extended to this area. So people of POK and northern areas became Pakistani citizens not by their choice, but by an act of Pakistani passed by Pakistani parliament, which again renders plebiscite uh, meaningless. Now, the this uh, Pakistan's you know the the control the rule by by Kashmir Council was was much criticized and criticized as a rule by proxy. Almost 40 years later, this was abolished. But before that, let me touch on something which I had briefly mentioned. That is, in 1993, this uh, Adad Jammu and Kashmir or POK High Court judgment came, and you can read the detachment of Northern areas from the rest of Adad Jammu and Kashmir, tantamounts to violations of resolutions of the Security Council. Now, this is a judgment of POK High Court, which I have already alluded earlier. And Despite this judgment, uh, Pakistan has retained the northern areas under its direct control. You know, they pressurized the POK Supreme Court to overturn this judgment on purely procedural grounds. There were no substantive grounds were given because there was none. Procedural ground was that, you know, the High Court did not have uh, jurisdiction over this matter because, uh, you know, POK is. Uh, Territorial limits are not defined, which is again very funny. That is, uh, in Pakistan's constitution, POK is not part of Pakistan. But when it came to uh, returning the territory, they said that you know, but you know, the High Court doesn't have jurisdiction on POK's territorial limits, which are undefined. Next, now. This is a 13th amendment of POK interim constitution. I was telling you that uh, the rule by proxy by Kashmir Council was criticized. So, in 2018, this is a year before deletion of Article uh, 370 by India, 13th Amendment of POK's interim constitution was adopted. Under this amendment, Kashmir Council was relegated to advisory role. Now, its powers were not transferred to the elected assembly. Instead, Pakistan has resumed those powers directly. So Pakistan today exercising exercises direct legislative powers over 32 subjects in POK. And the remaining 22 subjects also require Pakistani approval, consent, for initiating any legislation. So Pakistan has followed out autonomy of this region from within and such a major change which has completely you know they always control this territory that is no that is known but you know they have now assumed control directly in writing in a did you sense if you can use that term for something which is patently illegal now this unfortunately went unnoticed uh, by the outside world, including in India. My book has uh, brought this out for the first time. Next. Now, something 
similar happened in Gilgit Baltistan. In fact, Gilgit, please move to the next slide. Uh, Gilgit, Northern area, you know, I had shown you the POK High Court's judgment. After that, Pakistan controlled, continued to control this region, but they changed the nomenclature from northern areas to Gilgit Baltistan. The attempt is to distance it from the region's history, which and the UN resolutions, which clearly mention that uh, you know uh, that that uh, territorial status quo cannot be changed. So the the nomenclature was changed to Gilgit Baltistan. Now, in 2009, the elected assembly was given limited powers over 61 subjects. This was under Zardari when he was president of Pakistan. And why Zardari did so? Because Zardari was a Shia and Gilgit Baltistan is the only Shia majority region in Pakistan. So he was sympathetic and he gave them some limited powers. In 2018, the entire under Gilgit Baltistan order of 2018, the entire list of 61 subjects on which the region had been given, the elected assembly of the region had been given limited powers was abolished. Now, this led to widespread protests. Shah Khaksan Abbasi, who was then uh, acting uh, prime minister after Nawaz Sharif had been shown the door, was visiting Gilgit Baltistan. And as you see from the slide, the copies of the said order were torn in Gilgit Baltistan Provincial Assembly during the address of the Prime Minister of Pakistan, Chairman Gilgit Baltistan Council, prior to its enactment. Now, where have I got this? I have not got taken it from any media reports. This is from the orders of the Gilgit Baltistan Supreme Judicial Court, because the people of Gilgit Baltistan made an appeal to the Regional Supreme Court and the Gilgit Baltistan Supreme Judicial Court set aside the Gilgit Baltistan order of 2018. Now, Pakistan government went in appeal against the order of the Regional Supreme Court to Pakistan Supreme Court. And Pakistan Supreme Court sided with Islamabad and set aside the Gilgit Baltistan order of 2018, against which the uh, uh, sorry, uh, and, and and set aside the orders of the Gilgit Baltistan Regional Sup Supreme Court and restored the order of 2018. So, what has this order done? This order now, which people of the region were protesting, has vested all the powers in the person of the Prime Minister of Pakistan. Next slide. Now, this makes the region's situation, you know, something like akin to what Belgium was before the First World War. It was not simply, uh, uh, sorry, what Congo was before the First World War. It was not simply a Belgian co colony. It was a personal state of King Leopard, and that is the situation of Gilgit Baltistan. Now, let me show you something which is, um, you know, a very interesting part. UK supported Pakistan's case on Kashmir. In fact, Pakistan is UK's creation. And uh, the Pakistan talks about self-determination. Let me make a uh, distinction. Self-determination is different from plebiscite. No UN Security Council resolution on Kashmir mentions self-determination because the idea was still to develop fully. But this is uh, again a uh, uh, distorted narrative which Pakistan has adopted, and they are using the current terminology in the from the human rights literature in order to get some respectability for their claim. And of course, when this issue was being debated, Pakistan's case was supported by UK. Now, what was UK saying in case of Cyprus? And I, this is a quote question of circumstances in which the principle of self-determination could be applied in any of the territories of a member state was clearly an internal matter for that state itself. Any infringement by the United Nations of that fundamental principle would be regarded by the United Kingdom government as ultra bias and completely unacceptable. Now, doesn't it sound very similar to what India's position is? Next. And 
as i mentioned earlier both the uh, gilgit baltistan order of 2018 and uh, 13th amendment uh, took place a year before before the article 2 uh, 370 was deleted uh, by government of india now let me touch on the economics of the region the region has two only two resources one is the water because the indus and the, all the major rivers in pakistan uh, come from from pok or northern areas so water is the first and uh, this was uh, this is why pakistan built mangla dam and pok the, under during uh, ayub's time in which it was completed in 67 and the second resource is the connectivity which is given the uh, region's location uh, on the borders of central asia and afghanistan and, and china both these issues as i was explaining to you earlier were earlier were, were controlled by kashmir council not by the pok assembly and since then are directly controlled by by pakistan now pakistan has built bangla dam the construction was completed in 1967 for 36 years people of pok were not given the pesa for the electricity a hydro electricity derived from mangla dam in 2003 when the payments began they were given uh, uh payments at the rate of 15 pesa per unit as against 1 rupee 10 pesa seven times more to similar uh, hydroelectric plants located in punjab and khyber pakhtunkhwa so muslim of pok of kashmir gets one seventh of the price paid to the muslim of pakistan for the same molecule of water now this is how is this justified this is justified by pakistan in terms of article 167 of pakistani constitution which is given at the bottom of the slide and this essentially says that hydroelectric the royalty for hydroelectric power can be paid only to pakistan's provinces and pakistani claim is that pok is not a province of pakistan because it's not listed in as pakistani territory under that country's uh, <clears throat> constitution so if it is not part of pakistan how can the uh, you know it can, how can they pay the royalty in terms of article 161 of pakistan's constitution which only applies to pakistani provinces now this is convoluted logic first mangla dam was constructed in 1967 this is 6 years before pakistani constitution was the current con this is the third constitution third and current constitution came into existence in 1973 so there was ample time to reflect on this and make a provision in the new constitution to be adopted pakistan did not do so second that under international law if you buy goods and services from a region or a country which is not part of your territory you pay for it if india wants to buy cheese from france or machinery from china we pay for it neither france nor china are part of india so even assuming pakistani argument for the sake of uh, argument that they cannot pay because pok is not part of pakistan they should make the payment that is uh, the only natural course and the third is that since pok uh, pakistani constitution was adopted in 1973 there have been 26 amendments of pakistani constitution but this provision has been left untouched why because obviously they have no intention of uh, of uh, treating or of, of of paying their their dues to the pok and this is a major issue which uh, pok people have been uh, agitating uh, since 2006 musharraf at one point had ag agreed but 
no change has been made. They were again in agreement sometime about two, three years back to raise the rates. Again, it has remained stalled. Now, let me touch very quickly on the last part, last but not the least, and this is the elections. Now, elections in POK have produced this happy result that the party in power in Islamabad wins the election in POK. So, how is this happy coincidence arranged? Because of the electorate system devised by Pakistan, which is built into POK's constitution, of the 53 seats, a whole, a large chunk, 20 seats roughly, uh, 20 seats, which is roughly 40% uh, of the total electorate. These are reserved seats. 12 are, you know, these are called seats reserved for Kashmiris who are living in other parts of Pakistan and eight are for women and technocrats. Now, these seats, which are scattered all over Pakistan, these are basically in the gift of the chief minister or of that province or prime minister, because, you know, you can't really hold elections for uh, 20 people in one pocket or 15 people in some other pocket. So, it is their results of these seats are a foregone conclusion and this allows Pakistan to <laughs> manipulate the election results in favor of the party in power in Islamabad. Now, the second uh, very important point, and this is the complete demise of regional parties. This is in contrast to the situation on the Indian side, where PDP and National, Con National Conference for the longest period and PDP for a fairly long spell has held pass. In the POK Assembly, the last elections were held in 2021, there is only one representative of regional party, Muslim Conference, which was the party which had supported uh, Kashmir's accession to Pakistan. So, the region is run, controlled, not only through constitutional provisions, but through gerrymandering of the electoral constituencies and most importantly, through the political mechanism that only the the, the only parties which are allowed to contest are the local chapters of mainstream parties in Pakistan. It's, it's, it is as if, you know, India allows only Congress and BJP and other parties, you know, mainstream parties to fight elections in, in, in Jain, Jain K. This is a situation in effectively in, in, in POK because for fighting elections, you have to to, you need uh, qualification or disqualification uh, is done by the election commission, which is completely controlled by Pakistan. Now, the last part, and there's a second part, the last paragraph of the slide. You know, Pakistan has appropriated Kashmir cause, but how many Kashmiris are there in, in, in POK? Kashmiris are a mere 6.4% of refugee population and only 1% of total electorate. So, who are the people in POK? These are basically punchis or people from the Jammu region or people from Punjab who have increasingly, you know, in, uh, you know, infiltrated into this region. And of course, the change in demographic composition has also taken place in Gilgit, Baltistan, which has and more sparse, which has a sparse population, and therefore it was much easier to do so. And again, this is something which is being encouraged by government because Gilgit Baltistan is the only Shia majority region, Pakistan is a Sunni majority state. And this influx of outsiders over a period has, has resulted a series of, you know, sectarian clashes and invariably the worst victims are the Shias. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Shubhastha, for this very insightful and 
detailed review of the history of POK and the, their local dynamics in terms of radicalization, population displacement, the change in demography. And definitely it's so revealing and so insightful. I mean, we in the mainstream academic discourse and in the popular discourse, some of the facts which you highlighted never made any presence. They could never come to that level. And I, I really feel sometimes, you know, most of the time we are talking that India took the matter to the United Nations and you know, there is this is too much of cribbing about it. But then the very fact that India was the one who did not reject plebiscite was Pakistan, which rejected plebiscite and Pakistan was initially asked to remove, to withdraw its forces. India was allowed to keep a, to keep a minimum number of troops because India was attacked. India was the victim of the aggression. These things could never be brought to the mainstream discourse. And unfortunately, Pakistan could always use that propaganda of plebiscite to its own advantage. But I, I guess, you know, somewhere we really lacked in terms of making good efforts to that effect. Uh, so once again, thank you. But now we have a few questions for you. I just let me very quickly know. comment. You know, yeah. my book has brought this out. That is what the Pakistan's perfidy and the rejection of uh, rejection of uh, plebiscite by Pakistan and the book contains references. So if anybody wants to verify the claims or the statements I've, I've made, all those references are in this book and these are all based on, sorry, I'm holding it, am I, is it correct? So, and all of these are based on UN sources, UN literature, and Pakistani and international literature. The book has been published, Forgotten Kashmir, The Other Side of Line of Control by uh, Harper Collins, and is available on Amazon. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, definitely, this book is a terrific addition to the existing literature on Kashmir, and uh, certainly, I mean, even I, I, I would say very frankly that most of the think tanks or you know, private or the government think tanks or even the international authors, researchers focusing on Kashmir, they could not bring these aspects, I mean, bring these issues uh, to the mainstream and they could not highlight, they could not work on these things. But definitely since your book has come, it's going to be a great addition to the existing literature and will further strengthen the research in this area. So yes, sir. You brought the, the Pakistan rejected plebiscite every time it was proposed. Your book also mentions about the Sudan revolt. Uh, yeah. Could you tell us something about your research and sources? You mentioned that, you know, it's all from the, the, the like very well documented UN stuff and all. But apart from that, would you like to add anything to research, uh, the sources and, and the research? You know, I must uh, give credit and my thanks to US Congress, uh, US Li Library of Congress. Uh, because, you know, as a former Indian diplomat, it was, in, you know, I would never have got the visa to go to Pakistan and even Pakistanis are not allowed to visit POK and, 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 and we'll get Baldassan. So I got some of the, you know, most uh, important source material from Library of Congress in uh, Washington and from the UN li Library in New York and I have I stayed there and worked so I must thank these two and of course the third part is uh, my own readership I come from Lucknow so I know Urdu my language uh, language allotted to me in the foreign service was Arabic so I have I could draw on a lot of literature sources in Urdu which are not available easily in English and one of the Again, a very uh, an amazing source, which you don't find any ref m reference in uh, Indian writings on Pakistan. This is a book called Shahab Nama. This is written by Kudratullah Shahab. Who was Shahab? Shahab was an ICS officer who belonged to Jammu and Kashmir region. And after partition went to Pakistan and he served three successive governor generals and presidents as the head of the presidential secretariat for a period of 11 years. So he has, a, he had a ringside view of what was going on. And he has written a, his memoirs called Shahab Nama, which is a very well known, it's in Urdu. I have gone through 800 pages book 
Shahab Nama in Urdu. And of course, translation is mine. And the last but not the least is the uh, two volume uh, memoirs of uh, Yusuf Sarraf. Again, a, not just a senior Muslim conference leader, he has played a very major role in POK's creation because POK, it, after partition, there was a two month gap before the Kashmir Yasa, uh, joined India. And during this period, Muslim conference working committee adopted a resolution asking for an independent Kashmir under the Maharaja. And it was Yusuf Sarraf who got the decision chain in favor of Pakistan in the general Modi meeting next day. So, you know, he has impeccable credentials from Pakistani point of view, and he has given an expose of what Pakistan did eventually after it grabbed the territory. So these are all uh, Pakistani and UN sources on which my, my book is based. Thank you, sir. Thank you. The Pakistan talks about Azadi. Has it accepted the independence option? Never. And in fact, it is ruled out in POK constitution. I had shown that, you know, provision that nobody's allowed. Uh, I had mentioned that provision that nobody's allowed to question the ideology of the state's accession to Pakistan. And this is article 472. And it's not simply a constitutional provision. It is in basis on which the candidates are qualified. And this is also part of the oath of office of all the legislators and the senior officials of the POK government. And now there's a something more to it. In 1993, Benazir Bhutto, the then Prime Minister of Pakistan, gave an interview to New York Times and she was asked about the independence option. Benazir Bhutto's uh, answer, which I have quoted verbatim, she ruled out the independence option because she said she said that she claimed that this was a ploy to divide Muslim votes because she said that in case uh, a referendum was held with this option, it is known that Hindus, Christians, and Buddhists will opt for India. Muslim vote will be fractured three ways. She said two ways, you know, some will opt for Pakistan and some will opt for independence option. So she concluded by saying there would be no change in territorial status quo. Now, she had made two omissions. She had omitted to mention that some will also vote for India, some of the Muslims. And she said this will not change the territorial status quo. What does that mean? This was an admission that Pakistan will lose the vote in such a case because if Pakistan wins the vote of referendum, naturally the, there would be a change in the boundaries. So this was Pakistan has ruled out independence option. It is ironical and it's a complete travesty of truth that the trouble in Kashmir, so-called intifada of the 89-90 was started on the slogan of Azadi and Azadi is ruled out by law and by constitution on the Pakistani side of the line of control. JKLF, which was used by Pakistan to start the trouble, you know, Yasin Malik, Shabir Shah, you know, these are figures mentioned by Kakar, uh, the Pakistani caretaker prime minister, when he made his recent speech in Muzaffarabad a week ago against deletion of Article 370. JKLF, which headed this uh, agitation on the Indian side, has not been allowed to participate in any elections. And this in POK, and incidentally, the first elections in POK were held only in 74, almost a quarter century after Pakistan grabbed the territory, and then there was an eight years hiatus. Why? Because Ziaul Haq had staged a coup. So there were no elections in Pakistan. There were no elections in POK. So when the trouble began on the Indian side, POK actually, and when 85 elections took place, they were on party-less basis. 
So no parties took place and the next elections, JKLF was not allowed. So Pakistan does not allow independence option at all because it knows that this will go against it. Thank you, sir. So my next question is particularly concerning the autonomy and Pakistan often criticizes India that the autonomy of the state has been compromised after the application of Article 370. And related to this, uh, you mentioned that even the demographic status of uh, the, the Pakistan occupied Kashmir has been majorly changed. We often hear that most of these radical extremist terrorist organizations like Lashkar Jash. They have made major settlements in POK. They have uh, training camps. They are launching pads. You know, and Pakistan has also settled some of its army veterans in POK as a second and third line of defense. So, given the, this uh, status, uh, I would like to know your thoughts on the, how uh, autonomy of this uh, POK area has been successively eroded and compromised. And secondly, uh, is the uh, given the current dissatisfaction, uh, is there any possibility of an internal revolt or some sort of a turmoil within POK against Pakistan? You know, Pakistan controls POK militarily. Pakistan has sought to control POK ideologically by promoting an extremist version of Islam. And this is something which is being the, you know, propagated through these organizations, lashkar e taiba and jesh muhammad and they draw their strength from Punjab province of Pakistan, which is not from the from this region. The second part of your question, whether there's any prospect of uh, revolt or disgruntlement, I cannot say because, uh, you know, sitting here this is a assessment of the ground situation but there's a lot of discontent and there's discontent not only in pok there's discontent against the status quo in pakistan we have seen the food rights and the attack on the army headquarters and the core commander's residence so that country you know pakistan is going through a very uh, major turmoil Thank you very much, sir. Uh, and my last question is about the Chinese presence and the CPEC in that area. We are recently, we heard that uh, Chinese, uh, like they have uh, brought substantial military presence, including the air wings in Skardu, and uh, also they are. Uh, and, and, uh, one more thing, so because of the terrorist organizations, they are also a little bit worried about the sec security and protection of the CPEC. Uh, so, would you like to add something more to Chinese presence and CPEC in this area? You know, the Chinese are involved in building up hydroelectric plants in Gilgit Baltistan. Pakistan has encouraged them because the electricity from these plants will be evacuated to Pakistan. It is uh, interesting that Gilgit Baltistan itself is not connected to the national grid. So they will not benefit from the electricity from the region, but they will suffer as a consequence of mass displacement as and when these plants are built. There's a series of five plants which are going to be built as part of what is called Indus Cascade. And the two of the largest are Daimar Basha and 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 uh, Kunji. Daimar Basha is a 4,000 megawatt power plant. The uh, MOU has already been signed, and under this MOU, China will uh, invest uh, something like $4 billion. In fact, the major part of Chinese credit under CPEC to Pakistan is not going to Gwadar. Gwadar receives only $900 million or to other parts of Pakistan. The major part as much as 16 billion out of 23 billion committed so far two third is going into pok and gilgit baltistan and the gilgit baltistan gets the biggest chunk which is 12 billion dollars out of 23 and that is all going into these uh, plants and uh, on very 
favorable terms to Pak to Chinese. Uh, the Chinese have have uh, got a commitment from Pakistan government to ensure 17 percent return on investment in dollar terms, which is unheard of. So this is this shows you know this you know the, uh, if obviously if they are investing on such a large scale, they are going to be present there. They are also building a telecommunications line. There is going to be a large scale uh, network of roads. So the Chinese are trying to strengthen their position on the western on in, on India's western flank, just as they are present on the in eastern Ladakh to catch us in a pincer movement. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks a lot. Uh, so now I leave it to open to the audience. Uh, uh, friends, if you have any questions, please, you can share your questions in the chat box. You'll have to read it out because... Um, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll read it out some more than you. I guess your lecture was so comprehensive and so detailed that there's not much left to be asked for. We all look forward to reading your book and uh, certainly this has to be the part of the mainstream curriculum in the universities and uh, I guess even, uh, thank you. Right. For the diplomats, for the intelligence officials, this book is like a must read, I must say. Thank you. And for the IR enthusiasts. I would also like to share something since you know you discussed a lot about Kashmir, you know, and I also worked in Kashmir. The subject is very dear to me. I also wrote a book on Kashmir's terror financing. I just got released a few days. Today only I received the hard copy. So it's on the terror financing in Kashmir. Thank you. I would love to read it because I dealt with the terrorism issue also for eight years. In fact, I drafted the Comprehensive Convention on International Terrorism along with the then JCLNT, Dr. Rao. And I can take some credit for getting the negotiating mandate, which I did myself, or it's negotiating it in the UN General Assembly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So with this, we come to the end of our today's session. And once again, I would like to congratulate and convey my heartfelt thanks to Ambassador Shivasto for writing this amazing book and joining us today for this uh, brilliant discussion. We are all enlightened and uh, we are all uh, uh, like very benefited by this great insightful discussion. We all look forward to reading this book. Thank you very much, sir, once again, and thanks, uh, team, for uh, brilliantly organizing this discussion. Thank you.